How did David Foster Wallace feel about teaching this new generation of students? Students who had the internet for most of their lives, who came to class with phones, who went home and watched reality television. Well, today we are going to hear a very long quote from Wallace about the existential crises he would be going through as a professor while dealing with this new crop of students. And if you guys don't already know, Right Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to David Foster Wallace here on YouTube. And if you want more videos on Wallace, go check out the playlist down below and let us now hear from Wallace. Quote, this is true in my own case at any rate, plus also the uncomfortable part. I teach college English part-time, mostly lit, not composition, but I am so pathologically obsessed with usage that every semester the same thing happens. Once I've had to read my, my students' first set of papers, we immediately abandon the regular lit syllabus and have a three-week emergency remedial usage and grammar unit during which my demeanor is basically that of somebody teaching HIV prevention to intravenous drug users. When it emerges, as it does every term, that 95% of these intelligent, upscale college students have never been taught what a clause is or why a, mispla why a misplace only can make a sentence confusing or why you just don't automatically stick a comma after a long noun phrase, I all but pound my head on the blackboard. I get angry and self-righteous. I tell them they should sue their hometown school boards and mean it. The kids end up scared, both of me and for me. Every August, I vow silently to chill out about usage this year. And then by Labor Day, there's foam on my chin. I can't seem to help it. The truth is that I'm not even an especially good or dedicated teacher. I don't have this kind of fervor in the classroom about anything else. And I know it's not a very productive fervor, nor a healthy one. It's got elements of fanaticism and rage to it, plus a snobbishness that I know I'd be mortified to display about anything else. And Wallace has an interesting perspective here because he was teaching at Pomona College, which has a 7% acceptance rate, and the average unweighted GPA coming in is a 3.9. So most students got 1B their entire high school career. And the average ACT score is a 35. And if you guys don't know what any of that means, it means it's a very hard school to get into. And Wallace was teaching students who were juniors and seniors because Pomona is a mostly, from what I know, an undergraduate university. So he's teaching these juniors and seniors who went through the program and have taken multiple writing classes, obviously did very well in high school, did well on the writing portion of the ACT or the SAT. And they show up to his class and they don't understand grammar and usage. And this is all the way back in 2007. And we've... Um, moved light years in terms of culture and how kids approach knowledge and stuff in the last 17 years, which is crazy to say. But I do this every single year. So this year I am teaching a mythology class and it's an English class. And we're supposed to do a lot of the same things as a normal English class, but we're supposed to just be, you know, the core text we're supposed to be reading our mythology. And so for like a month, things are going really well. The kids are really interested in mythology. They love it. But then I give them a close reading assignment. And close reading is basically you got to analyze this. Don't summarize anything. Do a pure analysis. Don't bring anything from the outside in. Just give me a deep analysis of what's going on in this short paragraph. And almost no one was able to do it. Everyone just summarized it. And like Wallace, I had a total meltdown. I teach multiple multiple of these classes. So I'm like out of 60 students. So then I just kept trying. I was like, okay, maybe this was a joke, right? Okay. So I gave them instructions on how to close read. I gave them this full guide. This is what I'm expecting of you. Again, it happened. Almost all summary. Don't even get me started about usage and grammar and clauses because like that battle got lost a long time ago. So I had one of these meltdowns. And so I was like, you know, no mythology. I like, I was like, no. We went like back to the basis. We went back to fables and the easiest stories. And for weeks, we're just practicing close reading every single day. And then we slowly started working our way up to like easy symbolic classics like A Rose for Emily by Faulkner and, you know, started to gain some steam. And then one day a bunch of kids walked up to me and they're like, hey, I really thought this was mythology class. We haven't done mythology since the start of the year. And I was like, oh, I didn't even think in my head that we had like gone too far off the off the rails in terms of this emergency plan to help them be better at close reading. But Wallace should be mad and teachers all around the country should be mad because parents have failed students. I mean, let's just be honest. We can blame the school districts and the, and other teachers, but my parents failed me. I was not really taught how to properly write sentences or to analyze things. And I had to learn it by myself. I had some help from some teachers that pushed me in the right direction, but it was something I didn't learn until college much like these kids until my junior or senior year when I had someone really push me to hit this level of perfection. But looking back, it wasn't some insurmountable thing. When people hear about like, you know, grammar Nazis and like you need, need to be able to write well, it's under a thousand hours of actual 
real effort to reach that point. And I'm talking across an entire lifetime. And a thousand hours is probably the cap. Because when we look at most high school students and what they experience on the daily in school, they are just working for a grade. Most of the time they're tired, they're eating Takis, their their dopamine's all out of whack, they're scrolling TikTok, they have drama going on, they stayed up till four in the morning. And then they're in a classroom that most of the time has to cater to the weakest student in the room because you can't teach to the smartest student or everyone's going to fail or you know people at the bottom are going to fail. So you're teaching to the weakest student in the room. And a lot of the time, especially if a teacher isn't conscientious or really trying, a lot of students don't really progress year to year or only really get a couple hours of individualized work. I, from what I have seen, if you, if I sit down with the student and they come to my office hours or they come to like the creative writing club or something, or I just um, talk to them in class a lot, I can just with a couple hours of help, teach them almost more than what a lot of other kids learn the entire year in my class, which may sound bad. It may, you may, it may be like my, you know, like that's your fault, but no, like here we are, I'm teaching the students all the same material, but talking to someone one-on-one tutoring them, showing them what they're doing wrong, doing heavy edits on their papers and like, you know, really guiding them in the right direction does a lot. And once someone knows what to look out for and they start to do that themselves, like I said, it's less than a couple hundred hours away from them really becoming proficient in the English language and in writing. And so every single student that graduates that isn't proficient in writing and usage, which is most of them, which is I would say over 90% because we're hearing from Wallace here who's teaching at a school that has a 7% acceptance rate all the way back in 2007 when reading and writing scores were way higher. And he's seeing 95% of his students not having the ability to do that. So we'd have to assume at a normal high school or a subpar high school in 2024, it's way worse. And all these students are so close. They're just a little bit of individualized direction and tutoring away from being able to write and do usage at a decent level. And if you feel like this is you, you need to check out Garner's Modern American Usage. I'm going to put the link down in the description below. Wallace feels that this is the most important book for writers to have, and I would agree. And it's a good place to start because Garner is very lighthearted. He's not dogmatic. It's a funny book. It's Something that may take you a while to read, but you're going to start, you know, embedding usage and language into your own mind. And you're only at most, I probably, this is a high number, a couple hundred hours away from a massive transformation. I'm talking about the Michael Jordan who couldn't make the middle school basketball team to the Michael Jordan that was the best on the middle school basketball team in a year type transformation, a quantum leap. If you look into this stuff, because throughout my college and high school career, I really had one teacher until, you know, I kind of moved toward graduate school that really cared enough to push this on me. And if you are the same way, and maybe you've forgotten a lot of this, and you're not writing all the time because you have a job, then this isn't some insurmountable or boring thing. This is actually really fun. When you start to look at how people are messing language up and you start saying, no, you're not nauseous, you're nauseated you start being annoying, the world opens up to you. And Wallace mentions mentions something interesting here. He says, the solution is they should sue their hometown school boards. And I want you guys down in the comments below to answer this question. Whose fault is it? Is it the teacher's fault or the school district's fault? Is it society's fault or is it the parent's fault? And let's say you have to pick one. And from what I could tell, I'm, I'm going to blame the parents because when I look at how David Foster Wallace was raised, his mom was crazy. She was a lunatic when it came to usage and these types of things. But if you look at a child's life, which is 18 years living with you as you're raising them, if they are a couple hundred hours away, when they kind of become literate, when they, you know, are in the later phases of their life, but you could learn this early. Wallace was learning usage at, you know, five, six years old. If they are a couple hundred hours away from being proficient English writers and speakers in their, you know, in regard to their ability to use standard American English, then that should be easy. Kids who play sport easily put thousands of hours across, you know, their, you know, childhood and adolescence into sports. They put that much time into video games. They put that much time into church or all these other things. But when it comes to language, it's a weird thing because language automatically evokes elitism because if someone tells you you're speaking wrong, like that's wrong, people get upset. And I would understand that in terms of casual conversations with dialects, you know, people with a there's Rocky Mountain English and there's Black English and, you know, telling someone that their usage is wrong just in casual conversation, like that's a dick move. Like, oh, you got to speak in standard American English. And the yada, like, no. But if you're trying to communicate and enter the realm of knowledge and be a player in the game, you have to write in standard American English. Because if there isn't a standard, then it's just a huge entire mess. 
And so when people hear that like they're not speaking well or they can't write well, they think they're you're taking shots at their culture or who they are. But what you're what you know you're really supposed to be saying is you're not able to participate in this kind of game of knowledge. But no one cares about that anyway. No one wants to. No one even understands there's a coliseum of knowledge and these battles in philosophy and psychology and literature and all these other meta things that we're doing over here on BookTube. No one is really into that, and no one really understands the importance of that and you know, how that is the main element of mental education. There's physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental education. And being able to write in standard American English or whatever standard in your own language is the key element of that. And that's almost a prerequisite. If you cannot do that, then you cannot even enter the game. Just like in physical education, if you have a broken leg, you cannot go play football. Or, you know, or if you're a kid or something or too weak, you know, you you really can't go and play. And so you have to be primed to be able to do it. Or if you don't know the rules or something. That's a better way to put it. Like, if you don't know the rules of a game, you're not going to be able to go in and play without looking like an idiot. And so I don't know which one is a priority or needs to come first, that we need to convince people that that's important, but then we have to tell them, okay, now it's time to learn language. So there's this massive battle to just get people over their educational trauma, to be able to tell them, hey, you know, you're not speaking correctly. And I do it all the time. Like, I still suck at this stuff. Like, I'm not here up in the castle, but I have the ability to write in academic English. I have gotten, you know, papers published in college journals or like random things for like academic essays that I've done. That's not a crazy accomplishment. But writing is just the just is just showing what you're thinking. It's the, you know a direct transmutation of what's going on in your mind. And if people can't do that efficiently, then and if you look how most people write, then their brain is just if you anyone saw the Dune movie, like, that's what their brains are like most of the time because they they can't bring this to that. And writing and knowledge helps you relax and feel into all these things. And it's important. My God, in the realm of mental education, it's the most important thing. And my plan for next year for my students is I'm automatically going to expect all this. And over the summer, I'm going to develop about five to 10 minutes a day where we're going going to work on this so I don't do a total overhaul. So I don't just stop everything in motion and like have a freak out, which I've had a couple times in my career. And, you know, hopefully I can build them up a little bit more gently this time with information and kind of get them into it. And eventually, because, you know, I have 180 days as a teacher. That's a lot. If I can teach them 180 different things, that's a great start toward the end. So that's my perspective for next year. I'd like to know what you guys think. I want to know if what you guys learned. Did you guys learn grammar and usage and sentence structure in high school, in college? How did you have to learn? Are you struggling to learn it? If you guys want information on this, more information on this, sometime in the next two weeks, I'm going to release my David Foster Wallace course. I want there to be at least 10 hours of content, if not more, and a bunch of um, other fun stuff and some interviews and stuff. I'm trying to make it a big deal. And so when that comes, you know, expect that soon. There's going to be a lot of information about writing and a bunch of cool stuff over there, kind of from David Foster Wallace's perspective and exercises and stuff. So save up your $5 for that, and I will see you guys soon.